another the foreign lecture. Thank you everybody for coming out. And I just also, one thing I want to ask everybody is to keep your eyes open in the next week or so, but definitely before spring break, an announcement regarding Master Saturday, which is going to be coming up soon. Um, so a couple people have asked, asked me about that. We need to confirm the date, but we're going to have an announcement about that. Um, we're very happy today to have uh, Kristen Bergman um, talking with us, and we're going to turn it over to um, Dave in just a second to tell us a little bit more about... Uh, uh, Dr. Bergman and her research, uh, but a reminder that immediately following the talk today, there is a reception up in the Dean Suite on the sixth floor, so please come and join us for continued discussions after the talk. And so, without further ado, I will hand off to Dave, who will then hand off to Dr. Bergman. Great. Thank you, John, and, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker. Professor Kristen Bergman comes to us from the Department of Earth, Atmosphere, and Planetary Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She combines aspects of sedimentology, stratigraphy, geobiology, and geochemistry to look at how Earth's environment um, is connected with the organisms that inhabit it. In particular, she looks at Carbonate sedimentary rocks and its fossils. She and her research group, yeah, <laughs> Charlie, woo, yeah, <laughs> looks at <laughs> carbonate uh, sedimentary rocks and fossils uh, and looks at them using a wide variety of tools and explores the connections between Earth's early oceans and atmospheres and how they affected the evolution of complex life. She graduated from Carleton College in 2004, then moved to the California Institute of Technology where she received both her master's and PhD, receiving that in 2013. Had a, had a cup of tea as a postdoc at, at Harvard University and then joined the faculty at MIT in 2015, I think, if I remember correctly. She's very well recognized for her scientific contributions. Some of that recognition includes being awarded a Packard Fellowship in 2018. And she's also been a really important player in, the ge in improving the, the quality of our experience as a, as a geoscience community, both locally and nationally. And this part I won't remember, but I thought it was neat. In 2021, she was awarded the MIT Paul Gray Faculty Award for Public Service, and she was awarded this for in recognition of her work as a, quote, champion and staunch supporter of students and student-led efforts to improve workplace culture, which is fantastic. Her talk today is entitled Towards a Temperature Record Across the Advent of Complex Life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bergman as our support lecturer. All right, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's one of the best. All right, uh, it's great to be here today. I can't wait to have conversations after my talk. Uh, I want to hear from all of you what questions you still have, uh, what you're excited about. And don't hesitate to interrupt me during my talk if there's something that you don't uh, understand or you're curious about. So I want to start with the amazing students that have gone on this journey with me since I started at MIT. This isn't all of them, but these are the students whose work I'll focus on today. And I just put up here because I'm particularly proud of all of these students for where they are now. And so everybody is still in science. Um, a lot of people are either looking for jobs, have started faculty jobs, um, will start in the near future. And just thinking about um, all these people, their enthusiasm and excitement for similar questions to me and having this community that we've been building is really wonderful. And so this question that uh, is guiding us in my research group is twofold. The first you know, involves the history of life on our planet. Why was life microscopic for so long? 
So the first records of life, approximately 3.8 billion years ago, 3.5 billion years ago, um, record this amazing, diverse microbial community. And that microbial community maintained and persisted until approximately uh, 580 million years ago. So the second aspect of this history of life is why did things change? So over this relatively short, same length time as the Phanerozoic, we have a significant series of evolutionary advances. So we see some of our first organisms that made skeletons out of appetite, some large algal fossils, the first uh, organisms making skeletons out of calcium carbonate, macroscopic soft-bodied organisms populating all um, environments from deep to shallow water, and then obviously we move into records of life that are much more familiar to us uh, following uh, the what is often called the Cambrian explosion. So in this interval of time, not only do we see a size change, we also see a shift to uh, multicellularity, tissue level development of different processes like um, digestion, and also biomineralization, the ability to make shells. And yet, the environmental context of this transition remains ambiguous. And this is not for a lack of research, who have been working on this time interval and these questions for a long time. Um, but key aspects of the history of oxygen on our planet remain ambiguous climate, which we'll spend a lot of time thinking about today. Um, the carbon cycle. So in particular, this interval um, records some of the most extreme negative excursions in the carbon isotopic composition of carbonates. Tectonics, we have supercontinent breakup as well as large igneous provinces occurring um, in punctuated events across this interval. And we also have shifts in the carbonates themselves, which we'll talk about as well. So that aspect of climate is one that we've put a lot of time into in my research group. What was Earth's temperature history? Um, and in particular, what was its temperature history over this really exciting interval of Earth's history? And in part, this is because um, temperature and oxygen concentration often work in tandem to uh, constrain the uh, ecosystem level habitat that organisms can live in. So um, here you can see across an extinction, uh, both combined effects of oxygen loss and warming, and these often work together and go hand in hand. And yet, if you look at the number of papers that have been published trying to reconstruct oxygen concentrations across the evolution of complex life, you will find many papers. If you look for papers reconstructing temperature, you will find many fewer papers. Uh, and so we can start with the physical record of climate. And the physical record of climate might suggest that the Neoproterozoic was colder as a whole. So in the Neoproterozoic, we preserve um, two low latitude glaciations where we have glacial carbonate at the equator. And that's very different than glacial, glacial deposits from the Phanerozoic, where these maybe get down to 30 degrees uh, paleo latitude. And to get glacial deposits at the equator, modeling studies have predicted some pretty extreme temperature ranges from you know, minus 35 all the way to 50 degrees following the glaciation. So, you know, really asking what was the temperature that these early complex organisms are feeling is critical. If you look at another uh, record that's sensitive to temperature and one that we'll interrogate at length today, the oxygen isotope 
composition of preserved fossils, you can see kind of a broad decrease as you go further back in time. And if we think about the controls on the oxygen isotopic composition of carbonates, including fossil shells, there are two controls, the temperature that the fossil formed at or the shell was formed at, and the water composition that it formed from. And this is actually super powerful because if you think about aspects of climate, evaporation, the um, enrichment in delta O18 of the water and temperature are key variables. So delta O18 of water is also sensitive to ice volume effects. So other aspects of the climate, like glaciers, can be uh, caught up in this structure. And so if you think about this record as one that's purely driven by temperature, this gives you a completely different um, perspective on what this uh, temperature uh, might have been during this period of evolutionary advance. So the oxygen isotope record predicts gradual warming to very extreme temperatures preserved in these shells. And so how are we reconciling what this isotopic record is telling us about climate versus the physical record of these equatorial glaciations? And this ambiguity in the controls on the oxygen isotopic record of minerals precipitated, precipitated out of the ocean has led to a long-lived debate about whether the oxygen isotopic composition of marine minerals is primarily controlled by changing climate and the oxygen isotopic distribution of the seawater is broadly similar to today versus scenario two where climate was similar to today across lat paleo latitudes and seawater delta O18 was much more depleted even on the order of minus six minus seven per mil and spring predicted for the Cambrian. And, you know, this debate began in the 70s, so we're still uh, not sure what the main driver of these signals are. Okay, so the first challenge that we are facing is how do we under, better understand what, this, uh, what the main controls on the mineral delta O18 record are is in the deep past, uh, when it depends on both the water composition and temperature that that carbonate formed at. So here, imagine you measure one delta O18 composition of a carbonate. It could reflect any combination along this trajectory of temperature and water. So it could represent precipitation at cool conditions from New York fluids, or at hot conditions from deep basinal uh, brine. So in my research group, we've been um, working to deconvolve the two controls on the delta O18 record, uh, temperature and water delta O18, using a second thermometer, the clumped isotope thermometer. And so this is also an equilibrium isotopic exchange reaction. But instead of just tracking the oxygen 18 and oxygen 16 in the carbonate and water, we're tracking the carbon-13 and the oxygen-18, and when they're clumped together. And this is only dependent on temperature. It is not dependent on the oxygen composition of the water. And so if we measure the clumped isotopic um, temperature, we measure the delta O18 of the mineral at the same time, and we can calculate the water delta O18 with that carbon that. So we get a way to reconstruct these key components of the climate system, including evaporation and temperature and ice volume. In my research um, lab, you can see our mass spectrometer here. It's a um, mass spectrometer that allows us to measure very small amounts of carbonate. So 400 micrograms of carbonate. We're also measuring appetite across 8 milligrams of appetite 
This allows us to micro drill and do very specific work of carbon dates. And if you've taken Charlie's classes, I think hopefully you walked away recognizing that carbonate rocks are complicated with lots of different components. Okay, second challenge is that as we go further back in time, there's also ambiguity in the preservation of these isotopic systems. So for oxygen isotopic compositions of carbonate, they're sensitive to all of the alteration processes that you could imagine during burial, including dissolution, reprecipitation, dolomitization. Um, and the, the clumped isotope thermometer is, because it's dependent on temperature, it's sensitive to the temperature that the rock sits at over time. So if you bury your carbonate deeply and it sits at a hot temperature, then you will undergo breaking of those clumped bonds and diffusion. And so you will reset that initial temperature to something hotter during burial. And so these two components of the record are ones you have to grapple with. So what I'd like to do today is walk through the path that we've taken for um, three approaches to address these challenges. So first, we'll talk about which present modern analog is the key to the Neoproterozoic. Then we'll talk about is the clumped isotope composition of older rocks more reordered? And finally, is the delta 18 of older rocks more altered? So uh, the present is the Great, so we have a way to understand the past. Uh, maybe not mass extinctions, uh, but hopefully carbonates. So um, for many decades, we've turned to locations in beautiful tropical warm climates like Bermuda and the Bahamas to understand the carbonate rock record. And here you can see an exposure surface, some nice lytic, uh, Aeolian dunes, uh, some uh, root casts, and breccia deposits associated with exposure and karst, and lots of plants. So uh, these carbonates have been suggested to be a great modern analog to understand carbonates, including neoproterozoic carbonates. And so if we look at one data point, from a core over here, Unda core, it's off the main, um, it's on the Great Baham Bahamian Bank off the north side of Andrews Island. And it's clumped isotope temperature is sitting here at 18 degrees, 15 to 17 degrees. And the delta 18 of the water that forms this dolomite is one and a half. So dolomite is not a mineral that you necessarily see a lot of if you go to carbonate environments today. Instead of calcium carbonate, it's calcium magnesium carbonate. And while it's scarce today, it's abundant in the rock record. If you go to places like the Dolomiti Mountains in Italy, they are almost completely composed of dolomite. We have um, used two different approaches to try to quantify the amount of dolomite in the rock record, um, particularly in the Precambrian and Neoproterozoic. And the picture is extreme, where in the Precambrian, something like 80% of the carbonates, 60 to 80% of the carbonates are dolomite. And if our model is a dolomitization process like we see in the Bahamas, we should be worried about any efforts to reconstruct uh, past climate from neoproterozoic carbonates. So can we even get through uh, this problem? Well, uh, there are a few different controls on dolomite formation. So famous classic paper documents 30 
40 years, I don't even remember what it is, 30 years in the lab, no dolomite precipitation from seawater, where Lindsay Land left a beaker on his bench top and never saw dolomite precipitation. Move forward in time, we know that there are ways that improve the chances of precipitating dolomite directly from seawater. Microbes help. Um, increasing the salinity of seawater and evaporating it helps. Increasing the temperature into warmer lagoons. Uh, increasing the pH, changing the magnesium calcium ratio, changing the PCO2. I'll highlight these two, I'll come back to these. Some of the importance of clay minerals in both providing uh, nucleation um, and helping to drive desolvation of the magnesium water complex, which is one of the reasons why it's so hard to precipitate dolomite. Water hangs on to that magnesium. And also dissolved silica. This also can help disrupt that magnesium water complex. So the first uh, path forward uh, to thinking about neoproterozoics might be that we need a different modern analog to think about all of this dolomite in the neoproterozoic. So this is a picture from what's called a sabka in Qatar. And what you can see are these incredible microbial mats curling up at their edges where you can see some filaments tucked on the edge. And these sabka environments are usually very flat. They are dominated by microbial communities. They're producing uh, significant gas in the subsurface as they degrade organic material. They're often very evaporitic. Still on. Um, <laughs> um, okay, I'll do that. Uh, and, uh, and they, okay, they're producing dolomite in the shallow sediments, primary dolomite, helping help facilitate by microbes in the very shallow sediments. This dolomite is not ordered, so it's stoichiometric, equal parts magnesium and calcium, but it's not ordered. So um, that is something to pay attention to. So I'll go back. There are examples of beautifully preserved dolomites in the rock record that might be forming in Sabka environments. I'll highlight these ediacaran uh, pyzoids and cements that form in the intertidal zone from Oman, as well as from the Guadalupe Mountains. I love how similar these are when I first saw the Guadalupe Mountains examples at the hairpin turn after working in on for multiple fields and really excited because this uh, felt like a link to this ancient uh, paint. Another thing that my student Julia has done with her record of dolomite through time in North America is looked at the co-occurrence of dolomite and stromatolites. And particularly in the Precambrian, you can see that more than uh, that 90% of all dolomite is, um, the formations are 100% dolomite. So you don't get partial dolomitization of a formation in the Precambrian. And half of those formations also have documented occurrences of microbial communities in this form of these stromatolites. So if we go back to this potential second modern analog from these Qatar sabkas, we can look at the um, combined measurement of delta O18, plumped isotope, temperature, and calculated fluid. And so we can see that in these environments, it is more evaporative. So the delta O18 is heavier, warmer. So the temperature in these sabkas is 28 to 30 degrees C on average, but can get much warmer in the summer. Um, and now we can take these two modern analogs and go back to the Neoproterozoic and see what happens. So this is what we've been doing. See what happens, experiments. Uh, okay, so what I'd like to show is some results from three of our 
field sites, Oman in the Middle East, Svalbard north of the Arctic Circle, even with the top of Greenland when we go on the summer flight all the time, and Australia. I love that they scan so many different uh, modern environments on it. Okay, so I'll start with Australia. This is also work that my um, PhD student, Julia Wilcox, who recently graduated, did. And what we did here is we uh, took uh, samples from a core in the officer basin of Western Australia. And this core um, is full of components that are characteristic of Sabtas. So very shallow uh, mud cracked dolomites, stromatolites, and microbial communities, evidence for uh, anhydrite and evaporites, chert, silica. Um, and this is what some of these cores look like. Uh, so you see a lot of irregular laminites representing microbial communities preserved in very fine uh, dolomite muds. And this is where one sample from the core sits in comparison to our Hunda core dolomite and our Qatar Sabka. Yes, I picked it because it's really close to the Sabka, but the population sits around the Qatar Sabka. So this is from 500 meters depth. And it is also um, heavy in delta 18 water and warm in temperature. I'll point out over here, it's very small, but these are the temperatures over this interval from about 480 meters depth to 540 meters depth. And all of the carbonates that are not a class are under 40 degrees C. So this is not one special sample. This is the entire population of dolomites from this interval of the core. Okay, let's go to Oman next. So Oman uh, preserves a record through the Ediacaran. So we moved from the Tonian in Australia about 700 million years ago to the Ediacaran. And um, we'll come back to this, but preserves evidence for one of these very negative carbon isotope excursions. And we similarly, we see evidence for sabka like environments in these dolomites. So um, stromatolites, uh, dolomitic chip breccias, uh, buckled uh, microbial lamina, lamina with fenestrae, these gas bubbles, and stromatolites with evaporite glass uh, preserved on them. If we look at uh, the clumped isotope signal from one stromatolite, uh, it sits here. So uh, warm and enriched in delta 18 fluid. We take a mudstone from these units with very fine uh, dolomitic uh, crystals. We have delta 18 of the fluid of minus one, minus 1 1.2 per mil and warm temperatures. And then if we go to our third field site in Svalbard that preserves a huge portion of the Neoproterozoic stratigraphy and carbonates and some really significant components of our understanding of this evolution of complex life. The stratigraphy is spectacular and steep. Uh, you similarly see evidence for sabka like environments. So these um, dolomite teepees, mud cracks, stromatolite surfaces, and uh, early silicified interclasts that preserve some of our earliest record of algae um, and other eukaryotes. We also have evidence in carbonate of these uh, extreme cryogenian equatorial glaciations. So this is a uh, diamictite uh, with a dolomitic matrix. So if we go and we look at the dolomitic matrix that preserves in thin section evidence for soft sediment deformation, it sits up here. So it's colder than any of our other neoproterozoic temperatures that I'm showing. Uh, less than 20 degrees C and has enriched delta 18 fluid. 
However, that second challenge, which we'll spend a lot of time on next, did the clumped isotope composition of these outcrop samples from Oman and Svalbard get partially reset during their history because they saw deeper burial and higher temperatures. Particularly in Svalbard, uh, this has gone through an orogeny, a uh, mountain building event. And it's possible that all of the carbonates have been shifted so that what is now an 18 degree fine dolomite mudstone was originally much colder. So the second path that we've taken um, is to really tackle this question of clumped isotope reordering and how to get a handle on that. So the basis for understanding the susceptibility of this thermometer to heat um, comes from lab experiments where um, I, we hold a carbonate at a different temperature and sample it through time to see how its composition is changing. So in this axis, uh, warmer clumped isotope temperature is um, at the bottom of the plot. And so you can see all of these carbonates you know, recording an approach to hotter conditions the longer that it sits at these temperatures between 420, 430 degrees C in uh, at oven laboratory or laboratory oven. Um, so if we take those reordering kinetics and model what uh, would happen to a calcite that forms at 25 degrees C at Earth's surface is instantaneously buried to some depth with a geothermal gradient of 25 degrees C per kilometer, and then kept at that depth for this entire billion year history, we can see whether the clumped isotope temperature is reordered at all, and by how much. So within these first six kilometers, using one of these reordering models, we see that um, at five kilometers depth, we experience some partial reordering, not complete, so the current geothermal gradient in this model is 150 degrees C, but by a billion years that carbonate would only have reordered to 95 degrees C. Dolomite, based on these lab experiments, is more resistant to reordering, and so you can bury it deeper and keep it without reordering for its entire billion year history. So these early Sabka dolomites from the Precambrian might be you know, particularly resistant to reordering um, over their lifetime. So if we plot data that we've generated in our lab, data that others have generated from subsurface boreholes and core, we can plot their clumped isotope temperature, which is the color of the point, and overlaid on that and then they're overlaid on this uh, reordering prediction. So you can see how the calcite samples and the dolomite samples match or don't match this one model for reordering. Um, a 25 degree C per kilometer geotherm is a simplification of the geothermal gradient across the surface. So can we do better than this for these data points? So uh, the geothermal gradient is spatially variable. So for one of our field sites in Svalbard, it's particularly high. Uh, for some of our other field sites like Iowa, Oman, and Western Australia, it's actually particularly low. And this uh, Western Australian geotherm is something like 10 to 15 degrees per kilometer. So, if we go through the exercise of taking the current borehole temperature for each of those points and calculating based on that temperature for its entire lifespan, what its age is, how much it should have reordered, uh, we get this population of green points that show some evidence for reordering for calcite and for dolomite. So we could remove those from our collection because if they sat at that 
temperature for their entire history, they would experience some reordering. So we ignore those. Let's look at the data we have left. So for the calcite data sets, we have some, a few populations that suggest no evidence for reordering, um, but hot clumped isotope temperatures up to 85 degrees. So these are candidates for diage classic diagenetic modification during burial. And so it would be great to have petrographic constraints on this data to constrain whether or not a dissolution and reprecipitation process happened during its burial. And then there's a population that for this exercise I've arbitrarily cut off at below 40 degrees C, we can talk about that, um, that I said is prompting. And a similar thing to dolomite, there are many more samples of dolomite that based on the model should not have reordered, but that sit at these higher temperatures. But luckily we still have blue data that we can at least look at through time. So most of this blue data has been generated in our lab um, because we've tried to target these shallowly buried, uh, well-preserved carbonates. So one data set is from a shallow borehole in Oman. One data set is from a shallow core in Iowa. And then this data set over here is from that shallow core in Western Australia. So we can go back to this problem. How do we understand the delta 18 record through time? Is it a record of changing climate? Well buffered seawater delta 018 with diagenesis over printed on top of it? Or is it a scenario of a well buffered climate with evolving seawater delta 018, remember to value these that are as depleted as minus seven per mil, and diagenesis over printed on top of it? And this is the range of tools that have been put towards this problem over time. And so this is just those data points that based on their current conditions would suggest that they have not experienced reordering. And this is the delta 18 of the water that we get from that combination of measurements. And so, you know, current seawater, if we melted all the glaciers, would sit here at minus one, minus 1 1.2 per mil. So everything green and up, something that you might find across Earth's surface today. Uh, everything down here would fit with that model that seawater delta 018 was significantly depleted from the Cambrian and further back. And with the exception of this very recent environment that is clearly lacustrine, we do not see very many dark blue points. So thus far, we have not found good evidence that seawater delta 018 has evolved over this time interval. We also have a path forward that we're moving forward on to continue to probe subsurface samples where we have uh, a sense for their burial history and current borehole depth. So this is that core from Australia, and you can see how the organic thermal maturity maps onto the clumped isotope temperature results. So the coldest interval that is less than 40 degrees C, unless it's a glass, those couple of points, sits within either the immature or early mature range for the organic material. As soon as we move into the mid-mature to late mature, the clumped isotope temperatures are warmer. So we have a series of cores that were selected from various basins, particularly in Australia because they're really generous with their core repositories and access. And there are many intervals of geologic time that are preserved in shallow, immature um, wells. Okay, so the third path that we've taken is to consider the delta O gene of the rocks themselves. And you know, one model has also been, oh, all of those old rocks, those, that delta O18 is just evidence for more alteration of rocks the longer they've been um, uh, on Earth. So um, 
the previous compilation of bulk rock delta 018 uh, was you know last published on 2007 and uh, it only included data from the Precambrian, so there's no data to compare to the fossil delta 018 data from the Phanerozoic. And what you can see with these vertical lines is a single location plotted all at one time point. So we decided to start from the beginning because we have significantly changed how we're sampling the carbonate rock record for isotopic analyses. So here's the delta C13 record across the Carboniferous. And this is built by sampling carbonate at meter uh, scale resolution. So we get a lot of data points spanning uh, time uh, horizon. So this delta C13 record comes with delta O18 data, but it has never been compiled in the same way that the delta C, rec delta C13 record has for either the Phanerozoic or the Precambrian. So that's what we were, um, we've been working to do. And we're inspired by you know, efforts by Lorraine Lisecki and Maureen Ramo to minimize the effects of local alteration and conditions on the benthic oxygen isotope record uh, by stacking these records on top of each other. And they generate this record so we're gonna compile, build an H model, and stack. And this is a lot of data. And so um, different people from this group have worked on different parts of this record. And some of these people um, are undergraduates who so put a lot of time into finding old studies that had tables, but um, were never carried forward. There are some pluses to thinking about this data. The first is we get a lot more data, um, both spatially and temporally, by going after these high resolution delta C13 studies. So here's a sense for the record I showed before that's based on coastal fossils like brachiopods. There's 6,000 data points in that over the Phanerozoic. We've added 27,000 limestone measurements from the Phanerozoic, 4,800 dolomite records from measurements from the Phanerozoic, and then about 10,000 each of limestone and dolomite analyses for the Neoproterozoic. So that's a lot of data. You can also see all the clumped data on top of it. Okay, but I think it's important to remember, right, that for every measurement of these isotopes, there's a rock behind it. Um, and I like to call this the good, the bad, and the ugly. So carbonates, remember, are very um, sensitive to all of these post-depositional processes. So this um, path has really been to ask, can we even use them in deep time? And if we can, how? You know, like how do we minimize the, the ugliness in this data set? Because we don't have the details of what rock is behind. So um, I want to just show some comparisons of the distributions of data by period. So we're going to start with the cumulative distribution function for phosphatic fossils versus calcitic fossil pairs. So uh, the way this works is the y-axis record. So this is fossil calcitic fossil brachiopods is plotted in a dashed line over here. And then the x-axis record is plotted as a solid line, and they're colored by period. You can see the ones up here. We've only considered periods where there are over 100 data points in each uh, record. So um, appetite and calcite agree really well in their distribution uh, for the Ordovician, for example, for the Permian, uh, for the Carboniferous. Uh, for the Devonian. And you can also see that in this QQ plot where we're plotting the quartile, the um, fifth quartile for each data um, against each other, the 95th quartile for each data against each other. Uh, quantile, sorry. Um, okay, so now we can compare 
Phosphatic fossils versus limestone pairs for pipe period. Um, so some of these periods have agreement in the distribution and shape um, and median of these records. So the Triassic, the Silurian, the Ordovician, the Devonian are particularly good examples of bulk limestone delta O18 data sets. You can see that also in the CDS. The two <laughs> periods that really correlate are the Carboniferous and the Permian, which is when we had one of our big glacial intervals, the late Paleozoic Ice Age. And so, you know, you might ask, all right, well, preserving really cold temperatures in these abatite fossils, but we're not in our limestone. Is this evidence of processes similar to the Bahamian examples that we've been studying of carbonate diagenesis where they're experiencing sea level rise, sea level fall, meteoric alteration, resetting of the delta O18, specifically because we're in a glacial interval. Okay, um, we can also do the same for uh, period level pairs of dolomite and limestone. Um, and again, you can see that some intervals, uh, there is more similar uh, distribution than others. So the Permian, the Ediacaran, and the Conian are particularly uh, similar in their distribution. And I would point out that those three intervals are when we see the most um, clear evidence for very beautiful, well-preserved dolomites often formed in Sabka-like environments. Um, the, uh, another observation is that both limestone and dolomite in the Cambrian is worse than any other period that we've looked at. So the Cambrian, that fall off of a steep cliff to potential you know, 40 degree temperatures is not necessarily met with um, some of the data from the Neo Proterozoic. So by just looking at the fossils, I would say we've been misled in terms of thinking about the temperature history of the Neo Proterozoic. And another way forward that we're thinking about is thinking about where the distribution of these rocks sit relative to the distribution of fossils, and can we use that, these well-preserved fossils that have already gone through screening as a way to think about which delta O18 um, rock measurements to bring forward. Um, another thing that we are considering is um, bringing in at least their broader geologic context. So are the sites that we've gathered from mountainous areas that have undergone mountain building events or are they from stable cratons? Okay, and in the last chunk of time, I wanna to return to the Ediacaran, where we see this evolution of complex macroscopic life. So just as an experiment, this is a high resolution temporal record of the Delta O18 stack of dolomite and limestone from the Ediacaran. So you can see that the um, bottom of the distribution is highlighted in black, and there are certainly periods of the Ediacaran where the bottom of the distribution is 20 degrees C. The 25th percentile is about here, and the median is up here. This is all the data. Um, and I also want to highlight this interval that looks yellow compared to the others, uh, and its close association with this large negative carbon isotope excursion, the Shurem excursion. The Shurem excursion is the largest negative carbon isotope excursion yet documented in Earth's history. Uh, and the co-association of an excursion in oxygen isotopes has been documented and discussed. And it's been discussed as, is this evidence that this excursion is altered? Or is this evidence um, of something else? So, um, I've worked on this excursion in Oman, in the southern uh, south, desert southwest of North America, 
and something that I am passionate about because I think there's some really exciting, interesting things about the rocks hosting this excursion. So one of the things that I've done is I've just considered EDF and volcanism. And during the onset of the Sherm excursion that we now know because my student Marjorie helped add a lot of new age constraints from Oman on the um, carbon isotope record. So it used to potentially sit within a 30 million year window and now we have much better constraints on its timing and duration. And so that corresponds with an uptick in carbonatites, these CO2 rich volcanic deposits. It also um, coincides with some interesting shifts including transgression, so flooding from intertidal deposits into shallow subtidal deposits in Oman. We get an increase in storm deposits in the section. We see a significant increase in red uh, silts with a lot of uh, muscovite and biotite. Uh, and we also see this big shift in mineralogy. So we move from dolomite in our intertidal deposits in Oman to calcite to aragonite. And the calcite to aragonite shift corresponds to peaks in manganese followed by a peak in strontium um, within the carbonate. And we do see, unlike what has been talked about in the record, some shifts in the delta C13 of the organic carbon, but it's um, variable by depth. So I will show you my most favorite dolomite. Uh, this is a dolomitic oud, oolite from Oman, and this, uh, this is an oolite that shows up at the onset of the excursion in Oman. A very similar looking oolite also shows up at the onset of the excursion in the Death Valley area. If you are field mapping uh, geologist, the Johnny oolite is one of the early markers that allowed them to map the structure and stratigraphy of that region. And um, with some of our collaborators, we also have documented it in Northwest Canada. So let's go back to our list of possible controls on dolomite formation. Microbes, evaporation, high salinity, temperature, pH, magnesium calcium ratio, PCO2, clays, and uh, higher dissolved silica. And we'll just go through these for this example. So these OUIDs um, are stoichiometric today. Uh, they are composed of radial um, dolomite crystals, which I'll show you in a minute. There's man manganese banding preserved that you can map in um, using the electron microprobe. We do have ordering peaks uh, in the light. This is what they look like in thin sections. Um, sometimes there is no cement in between these uh, woods, and so you can see this outward growth of crystals, and you don't look at a lot of these woods, round grains rolling around in shallow, wave agitated environments. Uh, these crystals are particularly tiny. Um, so mapping them using the crystal orientation Using EDSD, you can see the dolomite crystals up here. Comparing them to calcinic oods just above them in the stratigraphy, these um, EDSD maps are to scale, so you can see the crystal size difference. So, you know, this crystal size map using the EDSD crystal orientation map doesn't really resolve what you might want. So, we took it to the synchrotron, and this is another um, of Julia's chapters. And this is one fluid from this rock. And again, the crystal orientation of these dolomite crystals. And so, you know, you can see bundles of crystals that are all oriented the same way. And the um, axis of those uh, crystals varies. So some of them are linked fast and some of them are linked slow. Let me look. Um, a little like a spherulite. Goes, starts at a core and precipitates outwards. 
Another thing that I discovered this fall using the SEM on these samples after fracturing them using liquid nitrogen and a hammer is an abundance of a clay mineral, allegorskite, which is a magnesium silicate clay with a tiny amount of aluminum. It has this incredible uh, habit of making these uh, uh, beautiful uh, bundles and sheets uh, and mesh textures. So this is on the nucleus. And you can also see these clay minerals outwards in the cortex of these radial fabrics of the ear. Palagorskite is something that's been documented in locations where primary dolomite is precipitating in sabkas in the recent past. And it does tend to form in bundles. So I think one possibility is that this clay, autogenic clay mineral and the dolomite are forming together, and that the clay is helping um, to provide a surface of nucleation and templating for the dolomite to give it this crazy structure. We also see evidence for microbes, right? Uh, so this is a stromatolite cross-section surrounded by these dolomitic fluids, and we also see some evidence for higher dissolved silica, which can disrupt the magnesium water complex. So these uh, stromatolites are patched with uh, chert. And the high silica hypothesis, I think, is really exciting because the Precambrian would have had higher dissolved silica over its entire history because there were not organisms building skeletons out of silica and drawing down that silica reservoir. Here's another picture of that stromatolite. We also see evidence based on evaporative um, gypsum laps that um, occur just below the oolite that we were um, in an evaporative environment with potential increase in salinity. This uh, stromatolite sitting on top of the oolite sits over here in temperature, so it is not one that would fall under that you know, arbitrary 40 degrees C cutoff. Um, and the fluid delta O18 is one. So how do we interpret this? Is it a combination of alteration and a primary um, temperature increase of some unknown magnitude? Is it uh, purely solid state reordering because we don't know the barrel history well enough of the outcrop? Although I would question that given that we have other constraints like organic um, thermal maturity data. So this is an area that we're still working on because I'm not giving up on this delay. Um, all right, so yeah, here's where that blue light so if we think about this, I think that there is evidence that maybe we should trust the delta O18 signal, if not in absolute magnitude, as evidence that there was warming associated with this negative carbon isotope excursion. And that second piece of the um, title towards a temperature record across the advent of complex life, I will bring complex life right at the end, um, and so up here you can just see uh, the abundance of these organisms. So before the Sherm excursion associated with the onset, we see um, a decrease in microfossil diversity, uh, including these really crazy spiny acrotarchs, these organic wild fossils. In the recovery, when the delta T record might be suggesting cooling, we see the first deep water, large, soft body Ediacaran fossils. And then it's not until um, a good bit later that the first shallow water, soft body Ediacaran fossils um, show up in the rock record. And I would argue that deep water Ediacarans might also be telling us that this is a temperature record because they wouldn't they'd be able to live in an environment that didn't so these are my conclusions. I'll leave them up there. Um, which present is the key to the past in the Neoproterozoic? I think we definitely need to incorporate Sabkas into that model. Is the Cat 47 of older rocks more altered and reordered? Yes, but I think that we have a path forward with subsurface materials with well-constrained immature organic uh, material. And is the delta 18 of older rocks more altered? 
Yes. But again, I think we can't just throw out all of the data. Uh, I think we have to continue to make the most of it because I think it is still telling us some information about climate change. With that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much.